Hello everyone. In this unit, we will resume the explanation of the remainder of the lesson, Intellectual Rubbish. I have explained the first part of the lesson where the author talks about men and women being prone to making silly mistakes. And all through the lesson, he is trying to give us some tips on how we can avoid those silly mistakes. Now continuing with this part of the lesson, here again, the rational man will admit that the question is one to which there is no demonstrably right answer. It is more difficult to deal with the self-esteem of man as man because we cannot argue out of the matter with some non-human mind. The only way I know of dealing with this general human conceit is to remind ourselves that man is a brief episode in the life of a small planet in a little corner of the universe and that for what we know other parts of the cosmos may contain beings as superior to ourselves as we are to jellyfish. So now here the author says that rational or sensible man will admit that the question is one to which we have no demonstrably right answer. No right answer as to which nation is better than the other, whether man or woman is better than the other. And then he goes on to say that it is more difficult to deal with the self-esteem, the pride of man as man. Because we cannot argue the matter, we are not arguing with a non-human mind. We are talking about another man who has got as much pride, as much conceit as the other person. Okay, so the only way is to, to make ourselves rid of this conceit or pride that we have is to remind ourselves that we are only a small event or happening in the life of a very small planet which is there in one corner of the universe and for what we know we may we not may we may not know that other parts of the universe or cosmos may contain some beings some living beings which are as superior as we are to the jellyfish so whenever we feel, you know, we are so proud of this and proud of that, we must remind ourselves, you know, see, look at this picture where this little man, so small, little speck in a small planet called the earth, which is there in the huge universe. So actually, I am one small little speck, so I shouldn't have so much of pride. Question, what is the only way to tackle self-pride? The only way to tackle self-pride is to remind ourselves that man is a brief episode in the life of a small planet in the universe. There could be more intelligent creatures than man in other parts of the cosmos. Other passions besides self-esteem are common sources of error. Of these, perhaps, the most important is fear. Fear sometimes operates directly by inventing rumors of disaster in wartime or by imagining objects of terror such as ghosts. Sometimes it operates indirectly by creating belief in something comforting such as the elixir of life or heaven for ourselves and hell for our enemies. So, the author says that besides having pride and self-esteem, we have other passions which cause us to make mistakes, other sources of errors, other sources of making mistakes. And one of these sources is fear, to be frightened. He says sometimes fear comes directly, okay, by inventing or making up rumors, gossip about the big disaster during wartime or imagining very, you know, deadly objects such as ghosts, like you can see in this picture, imagining there are ghosts and being frightened. But sometimes fear is indirect, okay? By creating belief in something comforting, 
such as the elixir of life so we can you know go through that indirect fear by thinking oh you know there's no problem for me okay i will take the elixir of life i'll take that potion and drink it i will live forever okay and i am going to heaven my enemies are going to hell so we can think like this and get rid of our fear now fear has many forms fear of death fear of the dark fear of the unknown and that vague generalized fear that comes to those who conceal from themselves their most specific terrors until you have admitted your own fears to yourself and have guarded yourself by a difficult effort of will against their myth making power you cannot hope to think truly about many matters of great importance especially those with which religious beliefs are concerned so the author goes on to talk about fear fear having many forms like we you know we have fear of death fear of dark fear of unknown and so many different fears and he says that very vague generalized fear sometimes we have a fear we don't know what we are frightened of but something is there which is making us frightened because we are not ready to admit okay let me sit down and think of what is the thing that is frightening me i'm not being specific about what frightens me so the first step he says admit your fear to yourself admit i am frightened of the cockroach or i am frightened of dark or i am frightened of you know sitting for my exams first admit okay and have guarded yourself by difficult effort of will against the myths or misbelief so first i'll admit my mistake then i'll go slowly slowly step by step and guard myself okay this is my fear this is now how i am going to overcome my fear okay so this is how we can overcome fear but there are many matters of great importance especially with which religious beliefs are concerned which we don't want to think about okay now fear is the main source of superstition and one of the main sources of cruelty to conquer fear is the beginning of wisdom in the pursuit of truth as in the endeavor after a worthy manner of life so the author says that fear is the main source of superstition when i'm frightened i make up different things and that carries on as a superstition or when i'm frightened i will believe those superstitions superstitions are not correct they have no scientific backing okay so fear makes us superstitious fear makes us very cruel okay when i conquer fear when i am trying to overcome my fear that is the beginning of wisdom okay i am now pursuing i am going in the pursuit of truth what is the truth why am i frightened it may not be anything and therefore i'll come to know that i have been simply frightened okay and i am attempting i am endeavoring to live a worthy manner of life there are two ways of avoiding fear one is by persuading ourselves that we are immune from disaster and the other is by the practice of sheer courage the latter is difficult and to everybody becomes impossible at a certain point the former has therefore always been more popular according to the author there are two ways to avoid fear the first is to persuade or convince ourselves that we are resistant or we are immune to anything bad any disaster that is the first one and the second one is by practicing or being totally brave to have sheer courage now in the next line we have two words latter and former now former means the thing which comes first in a sentence and latter means the second part of the of the sentence so in the first part we have to convince ourselves we are immune from disaster so this is a very popular thing you know we think during these covid times we have heard the word immunity 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 and none of us want to get covid 19 we want to be immune 
okay so this is very popular with us we avoid the fear by saying okay i am going to be immune the second that is the latter thing the practicing of bravery or sheer courage becomes difficult at a certain point primitive magic has the purpose of securing safety either by injuring enemies or by protecting oneself by talismans spells or incantations without any essential change belief in such ways of avoiding danger survived through many centuries of civilization so primitive magic you know look at this picture here they had these witch doctors who would come and do voodoo magic spells you know putting that uh, uh, tying little threads here and having those all those those spells those words that they they used to do magic okay and they would make people believe that we are keeping you safe and protecting you and at the same time we are curing you from sickness or disease of whatever okay so for many centuries people believed in these witch doctors and they believed in the protection you know that could uh, they that talisman spells or incantations could give them some kind of protection science has now lessened the belief in magic but many people place more faith in mascots than they are willing to avow neither a man nor a crowd nor a nation can be trusted to act humanely or think sanely under the influence of great fear and for this reason poltrons are more prone to cruelty than brave men and are also more prone to superstitions so all through these years we have been having witch doctors and people you know uh, believing totally in magic now with science being so popular and the advancement of science has taken place so rapidly that this has lessened the people people's belief in magic but still even though there is science and science is either you know there is only one answer to anything that happens so though people have lessened their belief in magic they place their faith in mascots they have lucky things like lucky handkerchief you know lucky shirt and lucky bat and and so many lucky things okay so the author says a man a crowd or a nation cannot be trusted to act humanely you know to act properly or to think rationally when there is great fear and so what happens at that time the poltroons poltroons are cowards are more prone to cruelty they become very cruel than brave men and also these poltroons or cowards are more liable to superstition something that is not proved by science but we have been getting too solemn superstitions are not always dark and cruel often they add to the gaiety of life i received once a communication from the god of siris giving me his telephone number he lived at that time in a suburb of boston although i did not enroll myself among his worshippers his letter gave me great pleasure i have frequently received letters from men announcing themselves as the messiah and urging me not to omit to mention this important fact in my lectures so the author says now okay we are getting too serious too sincere about all these things and fear and everything you know he says superstitions are not always dark and cruel and you know bad sometimes they add to the joy of life the gaiety of life he gives an example he says once he received a communication or a letter from god osiris okay so the man thought that he was god the egyptian god of the underworld and that man wrote to the author giving his telephone number and that man lived in a suburb a suburb is a border of a city which you know there are many houses where people live and he lived in boston in the usa and he is writing to the author saying that i am god osiris this is my telephone number okay and please come and you know join me as my worshipper so the author says that 
he did not join him but he felt like you know i mean just look at this this you know he 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 felt like this is a a, a strange thing in life something different okay and he has frequently very often received letters from other men who say that they are the messiah the promised one the anointed one or god and telling the author you speak in so many places please mention that i am god i am the messiah okay so he says all these things that happen you know they add to the joy of life otherwise everything would have been very very too solemn too sincere and too boring now i admire especially a certain prophetess who lived beside a lake in northern new york state about the year 1820 she announced to her numerous followers that she possessed the power of walking on water and that she proposed to do so at 11 o'clock on a certain morning at the stated time the faithful assembled in their thousands beside the lake she spoke to them saying are you all entirely persuaded that i can walk on water with one voice they replied we are in that case she announced there is no need for me to do so and they all went home much edified so he says another interesting incident which happens which happened in the year 1920 there was a prophetess a person who talks about god who preaches about god everywhere and she lived in new york beside a lake so one day she announces to her followers her the people who follow her a faithful that you know i can walk on water and i will do so at 11 o'clock in the morning now at that time the faithful meaning her followers they gathered or assembled in thousands beside the lake now she is a prophetess people are following her so she says are you all entirely persuaded or convinced that i can walk on water all the thousand people replied yes we are then she replies in that case what is the need for me to walk on water and she moves away and the people went home very much edified they knew that they had been fooled so they got educated they got instructed you know this is the way people fool us okay perhaps the world would lose so much some of its interest and variety if such beliefs were wholly replaced by cold science a wise man will enjoy the goods of which there is a plentiful supply and of intellectual rubbish he will find an abundant diet in our own age as in every other so he the author says that the world will be very dull boring place to stay if totally we only deal with science and forget all our little little superstitions and beliefs okay it will be very boring so superstitions also as long as they're not harming anyone they add to the fun in life he concludes the lesson by saying a wise man will enjoy everything of plentiful supply when there is supply of everything okay he will enjoy it and the rubbish intellectual clever rubbish that is there he will also feed on that in every age whether it is 1820 whether it is 1900s or whether it is 2021 we will still have people who are interested in intellectual rubbish and this concludes the lesson what is the aim of primitive magic the aim of primitive magic is to secure safety either by injuring enemies or by protecting oneself by talismans spells or incantation another question how does the prophetess befool her believers i just explained that to you so you can read through and uh, tell the story of how she befooled or fooled her believers what to evils does fear lead to how can one overcome fear fear leads to superstition and cruelty and the two ways to overcome it by persuading yourself that you are immune to disaster or by protecting yourself 
using talismans, spells and incantations. What two examples does the writer give to those who have opinions that flatter their self-esteem? The first example is about both men and women saying that they are better than the other gender even though there is no proof. And secondly, the author talks about each nation or country saying that they are the best even though each nation has its own merits and demerits. The author, Bertrand Arthur William Russell, third Earl Russell, that is he comes from nobility, was a British philosopher, logician, mathematician, historian, writer, social critic, political activist and Nobel laureate. He received a Nobel Prize too. 